Good afternoon, and welcome to the Restart Michigan Healthcare webinar. I am Renita Harris, Director of Engagement with the Detroit Regional Chamber, and I'd like to thank you all for joining this session. The Chamber launched this series of webinars to help businesses across the state prepare to restart operations and return to work. I would like to thank our guest speakers from Accenture for joining us. And uh, they are going to provide you information on this topic. But before we get started, I want to share that all participants are on mute. So, and you're able to submit your questions on the site where it says questions and they will be monitored and uh, brought up during our Q&A sessions for answers. And these uh, questions will be viewed directly by our speakers on the panel. I will now turn the webinar over to Dean Brody, who is a chamber board member as, and a senior leader of Ascension's, Ascension's Michigan office. Thank you, Marnita, and good afternoon, everybody. And I wanna thank the chamber for this platform. You know, if I think about the last couple of months, this has just been an incredible asset to our community. You know, it feels like the perpetual open mic, you know, multiple sessions per week are really a great place for us to share ideas. And I'm, I'm really hoping that the chamber will keep us going forward. Um, I also wanted to acknowledge the audience today. I know we've got a lot of members of our local healthcare community out there. And I really just wanna say thank you. Um, I know these have been trying times. I look at our frontline workers, uh, building surge capacity, extending benefits. There's just been a, an incredible effort. And I did want it to go and recognize in this call. So I just, you know, as a member of the Detroit healthcare community, I just really wanted to say thank you. You know, in terms of the purpose of today's discussion is we are going to offer our perspective on, on kind of what the future looks like. Obviously, the world has changed and, and with that, the healthcare industry is changing as well. And while we are offering our perspective, another goal is I'm hoping that we can give you a framework uh, that we're calling Health's New Future. And it may be a framework that will give you an opportunity to, you know, form some of your own perspectives and your own hypotheses about the future. Crystal balls are really tough. We know that. In terms of our speakers today, I'm really excited to have two of my friends and colleagues, uh, Kave Sabavi, who is uh, the global lead of our uh, health practice within Accenture, and also Kristen Fisseri, who is our North American lead. Uh, another special thing about both of these individuals is that they both have ties to this market, although they don't call it home anymore. But uh, Kave is a graduate of the University of Michigan, uh, where he did his medical residency. And uh, Kristen was born and raised in Metro Detroit. And although she lives in and Lynn, I can tell you that her heart definitely still beats here in Detroit. So, so with that, I want to encourage you one more time to submit questions uh, so that we can get our panelists kind of on their toes in the back half of this discussion. And then I believe I'm going to turn it over here, uh, Kristen, for some more opening remarks and jump. Thanks, Dean. And uh, thank you, Marnita. So thanks, everyone. Okay, thank you, Dean. And uh, thank you, Marnita. And thank you, Detroit Chamber, for the opportunity uh, today. I must say, as a, a kid who grew up in Metro Detroit, it really is an honor to speak to the Detroit Chamber today about such an important topic around the future of healthcare, its impact on the city of Detroit, the state of Michigan, and, and our country. Uh, as the pandemic has been, um, you know, impacting all of us over the last couple months, I, I like many of you, <clears throat> have been checking in with my parents, my aging parents, uh, as Dean pointed out, I grew up in Detroit. My dad's a retiree of the auto industry. And uh, last week I mentioned to them that I was going to be speaking to the chamber. And I'm fairly certain that there's been nothing in my professional career that has impressed them as much as me telling them that. Uh, so much so that on Monday, my mother uh, gave me a call and said, would it be okay if dad and I dialed in? Uh, I, you can rest assured my parents are not on this call, but I did promise them that I would do a good job and that I would report back on how it went. So. With that, let's, uh, Kave, if you would, let, let's jump in. Uh, and Kave are, and I are going to share our perspectives from Accenture's perspectives on the future of healthcare. Just as um, all of us remember 9 11 as being really a sentinel moment for um, us as travelers uh, and thinking about our personal safety as we traveled, either for business or pleasure, and the impact that had on the travel industry. COVID-19 is, is one of those sentinel moments impacting how we all think about health and wellness. 
And for us in the healthcare industry, uh, it is going to have a profound impact on us. What you're going to hear today is kind of is some of the key uh, drivers of that change uh, as we look ahead and how we're thinking about what innovation you can expect as a result and the, and the collaborations, uh, many of them non-traditional that we expect as well. Uh, there's two key factors uh, that I'm going to talk about uh, in a little bit more detail that are driving this change. One is the industry realities. For those of you that are on this call and are part of the healthcare industry, you're going to just nod your head and say, yep, these are some of the challenges we've been working on for, for years. Um, for those of you that aren't in healthcare or aren't part of the healthcare industry, those challenges were magnified and exacerbated by the crisis. And now all of you know about some of the issues we were dealing with, with labor shortages and supply chain. Uh, and those challenges have become imperatives to, re to resolve in very short order. The other key uh, driver of this change is what we're calling the, the human truths. And we at Accenture believe that COVID-19 is going to have one of the most profound impacts on humans, humans being customers, humans being employees, humans being uh, clinicians that we've possibly ever seen in our professional lifetime. And it's going to really dramatically impact their behaviors and their expectations of us in not only healthcare, but all of you as employers or leaders of uh, uh, employee employer organizations. So this is really driving what we're thinking about as the new business norms, which as I said, is gonna involve a lot of very interesting collaborations, we believe, and really a new framework for thinking about the future of healthcare. Let's go on to the next page, and, and I want to just um, double click a little bit on those um, industry realities. So on the, you know, the five that we've highlighted here, as I noted, these are issues uh, that we were dealing with in healthcare before COVID, long before COVID. Um, and as I pointed out, they've just simply had a spotlight put on them. And now all of us uh, are, are scratching our heads, whether we're in healthcare or not, saying we've really got to change these for the good of um, our society and our country. And those are things like labor shortages. We've, we've talked a lot about that historically around the fact that we are short from a clinician perspective. Well, COVID uh, drove that uh, reality in, in, in multifold, 20-fold in the case of nurses. And the fact that the other thing that we're worried about as it pertains to labor shortages coming out of COVID is the, is the burnout factor. And the fact that, as this stat shows here on the right-hand side, 70% of healthcare workers note that they feel burnt out or some mental health uh, issues coming out of this crisis. And does that mean that that shortage that we were already grappling with gets worse? Capacity constraints. Before COVID, we were actually looking at ways we could reduce the number of hospitals and hospital beds, physical facilities. Uh, they're costly to invest in. But COVID, we were you know, finding ourselves, we were short um, of inpatient beds and ICUs, so much so that we were pulling ships into the harbor of New York. So it's forcing us to think about, we've got to really think differently about the way in which we manage physical sites and facilities and also reimagine different channels for uh, treating our patients. Not many of you probably that are outside of healthcare talked much about supply chain and healthcare prior to uh, COVID, but all of you became very conversant in what PPE is and where it's coming from and how it's utilized. And um, that's because uh, we had a, you know, we have some real challenges in the supply chain of healthcare. Um, one of the things that um, probably became um, apparent to many of you is that 75% of that PPE was manufactured outside of the United States. And when that supply chain fell, you know, uh, was strained as a result of the uh, pandemic, uh, we were really struggling and scrambling and relying on some great um, companies, certainly in the state of Michigan, to reimagine how they, uh, you know, reutilize uh, manufacturing capabilities to supply ventilators or PP&E. So we have some work to do around thinking about different ways to um, make sure that supply chain is not a hurdle to creating patients in the future. And then digital capabilities. This is something that we were certainly doing on the payer side, the insurance side of healthcare. Um, and we were really starting to make the uh, turn towards this really being an imperative in, on the hospital side. But now um, we've overnight We've uh, introduced patients and physicians and clinicians and to uh, telehealth. And, and the interesting thing is they liked it. 
we showed uh, patients that we could actually do uh, telehealth. I think it, uh, pre-COVID, we were at like 7%. Um, different statistics will tell you we increased that by 600 to a couple thousand percent, but regardless, they, they found it worked. And so now we have to figure out uh, what the right balance is going forward, and, and we will. And then fragile economics. Um, the reality of the, the fact that our hospitals operate on very thin margins became very apparent um, as we struggled. Um, you know, hospitals were being squeezed from both ends. Um, volumes, electives were down dramatically, and they were having to spend a lot to uh, support and protect their facilities, et cetera. And so we have uh, some economic uh, issues that we've really got to reconcile quickly and really imagine the business model for health. Let's go to the next page and talk about the human realities. Every one of you on this call can probably relate um, to the words that are on this page. And these are really the, the what we call the five human truths. And interestingly, early in the pandemic, uh, Kaveh, Dean and I have colleagues in our uh, Accenture Interactive um, who really think about the intera interaction with customers and, and humans for that matter. And, and they produced this study, uh, and it's since been backed up with a lot of data around really what are going to be the profound changes to the way in which humans react from, to, from this pandemic. And we can all relate to the fact that confidence has been shaken. We can all relate to the fact that virtual and distance, the word social or the term for socially distance has become part of our vernacular. And what does that mean? We can all relate to the fact that healthcare is now everyone's business. All of you now have a, a new appreciation for the importance of healthcare to not only your families, but to your coworkers uh, and to your society and your communities. And there's a couple of interesting things here. I think what we are going to see, and this is what we're inspired by, is not only what we saw come together as part of the pandemic, where you had um, you know, uh, world-class brands like GM and Exxon and others and, and Ford and many others in the state of Michigan um, uh, rally together to help support us in a time of need in the industry. Um, but I also am very interested in looking at what will that mean for the future in terms of how their role uh, in supporting healthcare going forward, not only as a partner because they have employee, large employee bases and they care about um, the health and wellness and the costs of that health and wellness of their employee base, but also their potential role in reimagining healthcare. One of the things that we were doing before COVID was something called a, a convergence factor. And we were watching how many Fortune 500 companies were talking about investing in healthcare, those that actually were not already part of the health ecosystem. The interesting thing is before COVID, that number was about 70%. Big brand name outside of healthcare organizations were thinking about or talking publicly about investments in healthcare. And we anticipate that will only continue as we look to the future uh, coming out of this. And certainly uh, as some, there's more energy and interest in moving some of the the healthcare supply chain, at least, uh, back on shore. And then the fourth and the fifth, the fourth is around cocooning. All of us are thinking about ways in which we can do more in our home. Is there more ways we can uh, engage with the healthcare system from our home uh, in various ways, take care of loved ones, aging parents or children in a way um, uh, that we utilize our home? So we're, we're thinking about that as um, that impacts the future of care. And then finally, um, you know, authority and the role in which and we anticipate um, very different partnerships coming together, whether it's uh, between healthcare and state governments, city governments or the federal government, lots of change and opportunity there in terms of uh, driving the health and wellness of our communities. And then let me talk about the business storms and then I want to hand it over to Kave to kind of talk about our, our framework. So these are really the three most these are the three imperatives that are going to be with us for a while. And again, these are focused on healthcare, but I would argue they're relevant to any industry that's on this call. It's about persistent distance. The notion that um, having a virtual channel or having a web presence was con is convenient has now become a necessity because we've got to find ways in which we can engage our patients, our customers at a distance. 
As I noted earlier, pre-COVID, 7% of um, uh, health visits were done virtually. We anticipate over the next two years, that'll settle in at about one in three, so 30, 30 35%. So we've got to imagine what that means. And the key is, which of those visits are going to be done virtually, which is, versus which have to come back to a physical site? And how do we assure a population that right now says uh, they're very nervous about going back into a medical facility? How do we assure them that it is safe to do so? Which leads me to the second one around trust. And it's broader than just trust between health core organization, whether that's an insurer or a pharmaceutical company or a, a provider. It's around all of us viewing our role in building community trust. Um, there's been a, a lot of uh, research that we've seen and we continue to add to it around the importance of brand and those that are going to navigate this pandemic and be viewed as caring about their employees and about their humans, again, uh, are going to benefit from a brand perspective. We believe that'll be a 2X in terms of net promoter score benefit. And so it's really important that we think about not only the physical health and wellness of the humans that we interact with, but the mental as well, which leads me to surge as a requirement. This is a word that now has to become really pervasive in how we think about healthcare. Um, certainly we experienced an extraordinary surge uh, with this pandemic. And everybody, uh, I think, pretty much agrees that we'll see another surge, then hopefully it won't be as uh, significant uh, as the one we just saw. But we're also watching other surges. And one of the surges I would, um, uh, I think we will see, and we talk about it as the next curve we might, we have to flatten is around mental health. And coming out of this pandemic, uh, we certainly had a mental health issue. One in five adults in this country suffer from mental health. We think that will only be accelerated. And we've got some challenges there, back to the labor constraints. We see that there's potentially, we're, we're short 250,000 mental health workers in this country. So as employers and leaders uh, of these companies, we have to be mindful of what surge could mean. And we as healthcare leaders have to be mindful of preparing so that the, organ the, the infrastructure does not cripple when some of these sur other surges come, whether that's financially or the facilities or the care capabilities to support it. And so with that, I wanna transition to these really drive what Kaveh is gonna take over for me here. If we go to the next page, teeing up what we believe is the imperative for a new future framework. And so with that, I'm going to hand it to my colleague, uh, Dr. Sababi, to talk about the new future framework. Bobby? Thank you, Kristen. Thanks, Kristen. Good to be with everybody. Um, if you start with where Kristen opened, which is that, uh, that the environment that we're in now uh, is not just the environment that we had pre-COVID, but we have new citizens' attitudes toward life and a recognition that some of the most difficult complex problems in society need to be addressed by all parts of society working together. And then we think back to health. What we have concluded is that the way to think about health is through this lens that is now informed by the problems that existed and the opportunities that existed before COVID, plus these new factors. And it really, uh, we used a lens, uh, a four item lens to start thinking about health. One is healthcare. One is the role of society. And when we talk about the role of society, it's a recognition that health and well-being are now part and parcel of every part of the, of the world we live in, not just the part that has to do with healthcare. So our willingness to engage with a retailer or go on a trip has a health and a well-being component to it that we have to think about as a simple example. Work has changed. We'll talk a little bit more about that. And then uh, at the, uh, the fourth future is really a set of foundational capabilities that give organizations the ability, the resilience to deal with the kind of shock to the system that we just experienced. The, the, the essence of this is that our health is fundamentally the output of an ecosystem of activities. People have talked about that forever. And one of the interesting characteristics about ecosystems is that they generally can't change from inside they change in response to a stress from the outside. And that's true of biological systems and social systems. And historically, when we've 
pondered how hard it is to solve healthcare problems, we've said, well, eventually a shock to the system, a financial shock to the system will cause things to be different. Well, the truth is we have suffered a shock to the system, and that is a, a global pandemic, the kind of which we haven't seen for 100 years. And coupled by the economic recession that followed the social distancing, we are experiencing a true shock to the system. The effect of that is not to simply solve the problems that we had before, but to really change the way those problems are going to be solved, as well as to change the relative priority and order in which they'll get addressed, as well as the way we think about return on investment as we start to uh, address some of these issues. I'm gonna take each of those four futures and just give you a little bit more detail. The future of care is fundamentally everything that we did before, but adding the concept of distance. And the reason for distance is not the way we used to think about it, because we've known for a long time that people want care on their own terms. And we've thought about things like uh, being able to, to meet people on their own terms as something that has to do with a better experience or maybe a better uh, economic outcome. But now we've introduced distance as a requirement because it's also safer from a contagion perspective. And the idea that in, some, in many cases, the right thing to do is to keep the party separated in order to um, optimize their health is suddenly a new consideration. There are provider organizations right now that are rethinking and, um, and essentially eliminating waiting rooms as a structural part of an outpatient visit permanently for everybody, asking the question, isn't that an archaic way of queuing people? And doesn't it introduce, uh, not only is it not great from an experience perspective, but it's not great from an infection perspective. So. We're starting to see that level of thinking being introduced. Uh, the, Kristen made an important point, which is that, that where this settles in at isn't necessarily the post-COVID world, but we think that the experience that patients and doctors have had with what is possible will never regress back to the pre-COVID state. It will be a permanent foundation and it will drive continued evolution. I wanna talk a little bit about society because this is a really important point. What we have, the pandemic has proven to us that, that health care, well, health well-being is a combination of health care and the social system. Whether you think about the mortality rate from COVID or you think about the need to move resources from areas where they're unused to areas where they are new, you, uh, necessary, where organizations have to work together to meet the surge requirements, where government has to work with non-healthcare industries in order to solve this problem. What we recognized here is that the problem of the health of society is not just the problem of healthcare, it is the problem of society, and it will forever be the problem of society, and that everyone has a stake in it, whether they're a healthcare organization or not, and that the economic the economic needs of the healthcare organ of healthcare have to be a consideration for all of society because ultimately, if we don't solve that problem, if we, we don't have the ability to solve our well-being, our our, our uh, uh, livelihood problems, if we don't solve our living problems, and work has been affected forever. And when we think about this now, the nature of work, we start to consider things like the health of our workforce. We start to think about how humans and machines work together. The old way we thought about humans and machines was largely in the context of how do you make people more productive or more effective at their job. But in fact, part of the reason that we have humans and machines working together is to create an environment that is safer for humans by having those tasks that might introduce risk, risk of contagion, either to the person providing the services or the person receiving the services might be better done by technology. And this calculus is a new part of our return on investment around using technology uh, to uh, augment our workforce. We also think that we are pivoting the way we think about place, uh, the place of work from this idea of coming to office as the default position. And you had to make the argument about why you didn't have to come to the office to one where you might have to make an argument about why you do have to come to an office. And that is not a health specific, that is a society, uh, a general society question. So these are significant mental models that have been affected by COVID and we don't think will ever go back. And it will affect both, it will affect the health and well-being of everybody, whether they're receiving healthcare or not. 
finally is the concept of our future foundation and what what the covid pandemic followed by the social distancing followed by the economic hardship that has that that we are experiencing has proven to us is that our businesses need a level of resilience that they were simply unprepared for and that resilience comes in many areas one of the things that this exposed was how critical supply chain is to a business's resilience we optimize our supply chain for economic efficiency we didn't optimize it for resilience and now we understand uh, not only do we have more than one source but where are those sources located matters and that conversation is going to is going to uh, raise its head again with vaccines. If you've been following the the, uh, the 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 policy conversations around vaccines, these vaccines are being developed in many countries. And because there are going to be more people than there are vaccines, the countries are all thinking about how they hoard their intellectual property and their vaccine and keep it within their country. And as a society, we're going to have the same issue we had with PPE, which is no single country can solve the problem on their own. And somehow or another, we're gonna to have to figure out what the collective model is going to be. But that is a resilience problem that is very complicated. The second big issue is what we realized and what, what every business, healthcare and non-healthcare realized is how critically dependent we are on having a digital infrastructure in order to survive the kind of shocks that we have just experienced and specifically the dependency on public cloud. This entire pandemic has emphasized how necessary the public cloud is as part of a business's resiliency strategy. And we see, for example, uh, people prognosticating that the percentage of work that's being done by organizations in a public cloud environment, the amount of computation and storage is going to be dramatically greater than what we thought the pace would be because the ability to work virtually, the ability to access supply chains virtually, the ability to interact with people who are bringing novel solutions that you might be able to use are all dependent on these kinds of approaches. So the supply chain and the technology are critical. There's also concepts of financial stability, like how do we, for example, uh, allow our hospitals and doctors to stay in business when all the elective work disappears, because we need them to stay in business, is a public policy question that we're now struggling with. The net effect of these four futures is really that the concept of health and well being has gone from one thing we worry about to something that everyone needs to worry about. And they need to worry about it as part, uh, part and parcel and fiber of the businesses that they're in. The healthcare system will respond to the effect of COVID. I think that what will be the most interesting is not just how healthcare responds to COVID, but how all of society responds to COVID. And whether some of these concepts, like the concept of a safe and healthy experience because of the possibility of a contagious disease, infiltrates our mentality the way, for example, the concept of terrorism became part of our mentality after 9-11. We don't experience it every day, but we forever consider that in the calculus of how we conduct our lives. And I believe that going forward, we will forever consider how pandemics might affect our lives, even though it's not there every day, and build that into the calculus of how we conduct ourselves uh, in all aspects of our business. And with that, I think, uh, Dean, I think we're at an opportunity now maybe to open up to uh, questions from the audience. That's right. Uh, thank you both. So we've got about 15 minutes left for Q&A. We've got a few that are kind of in the chat box, but I just want to encourage uh, the audience out there to submit your questions and we'll we'll get to as many as possible. So the first one uh, is asking, what, will independent hospitals be able to survive the next 12 to 18 months? And, and maybe, maybe I'll expand to the question, you know, if there's a perspective, not only on hospitals, but independent physician organizations. Yeah. Um, so. Well, so I'll take a shot at that. So uh, we know that um, it is extremely hard to close a hospital, even when they fail financially. That's true nationally, and that's pre-COVID. And that's because uh, hospitals have a significant role uh, in society. They have a role as an employer. They have a role also as a source of safety and a source of identity. Uh, so the question isn't, are they going to survive? The question is, what form will it take? in terms of the necessary support that they get? Will it be coming from public sector or private sector, what the combination will be? 
when you start to ask the question about independent physicians, now you're getting into, there's two questions. One is physicians practicing medicine. The other is what legal and economic entity will they practice in? The mm -hmm. legal and economic entity, that's a fair question. And that's up for, uh, up, up for grabs because one of the things that's happening now is the, uh, the acute loss of elective procedures from the healthcare system has created real significant economic hardship for healthcare providers, doctors and hospitals who provide those services. And they can't make that up in a few months. And therefore organizations that are not economically well positioned are going to need to seek sanctuary from organizations that are better positioned. So it might result in a resorting of legal entities and business entities. I don't think it means that the capacity comes out of the system because I think we as a society will figure out how to keep the capacity in the system, but it may not be in the same business form. Okay, thank you. So uh, another follow-on question here is, and you know, you mentioned this in the presentation, but uh, obviously there's been this proliferation of virtual care, you know, just wild explosion and increases. Yes. As we look ahead, you know, what are the kind of services that we expect will remain virtual? And, you know, what's our perspective sure. on the services that might go back to an office setting or should go back to an office setting? Right. I'll set that up. I'll talk a little bit about it. I'll yeah. give Kristen an opportunity too. So uh, if you look pre-COVID, uh, population, uh, basically research suggested that um, somewhere around 5% of Americans have had some kind of a virtual healthcare experience. So pre-March 2020. And if you look at opinion surveys taken in the last three months, uh, you're seeing in the 40 to 50% of people saying that they've had a virtual experience in the last three months. And then from the lens of the delivery system, if you're not providing COVID care or acute care, uh, most doctors are reporting 80 or 90% of all the work that they did is, had been done virtually. The problem is they did that out of requirement, not out of preference. It was a forced requirement. And Nobody believes that that's the right percentage. And everyone recognizes that there was services that were provided virtually that should have been provided in person. For example, you can't examine a patient virtually, not certainly without them going somewhere else. You can't obtain a lab specimen virtually. You can't obtain a local, you can't provide any kind of a immediate uh, local treatment without seeing a person. So there's a whole bunch of things that have to be done that probably were compromised. Uh, our projections actually are that when this all settles down, around a third of the services that have been provided historically can be provided virtually. But even that's not just a conversation or a conversation with video. We are going to have to figure out how to do things like examine someone remotely. And the technologies exist. We don't have the, quite the business models yet, but it is quite possible for a patient to go to a place or for someone to come to their home and use a device to get uh, blood pressure or oxygen levels or uh, heart rate or all those sorts of things. So the doctor and the patient can still be separated. Similarly, obtaining tests, lab tests. So as we, what you will see is innovation around examination and diagnosis uh, and testing that will allow us to have some greater level of persistence with the idea that care should be able to be provided at a distance and on the patient's own terms, wherever they want them to be. And the, the technology exists now. The good news is COVID has created an experience that both the doctor and the patient recognize as possible. That was one of the most critical steps and that will never go back. And then you combine that with the innovations and I think we're gonna land in the 30% range. Kristen? And I'll just, the only thing I would add, I agree wholeheartedly, um, is you know people need to understand that part of the impediment for you know, the fact that we had such low adoption of telehealth was that the regulatory um, parameters yes. were not in place right. for us to, um, you know, for payers to be incented to reimburse and providers as well. Um, overnight, we changed that, but that's temporary. So we're, we're you know, we've got to see where that settles right. back. I do think, though, there's going to be obviously a lot of incentive to um, make sure that the, um, you know, the regulatory environment aligns with where uh, patients right. and providers want it to be, uh, because as Kave pointed out, without a doubt, the experience has been positive. Doctors realized they could do telehealth. They liked it. Uh, they like it for a number of reasons, uh, and it gives them a lot of flexibility, it addresses some of the burnout that we were talking about earlier. Right. Patients realized they liked it as well. So right. more to come on that. Yeah. So, so this question is related to return to work, and I know, Kristen, this is a topic you've been thinking a lot about. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, within our state, our governor's 
made another announcement. We'll have uh, more industries opening up on the 4th and the 8th. Manufacturing mm -hmm. opened up in May, obviously with restrictions. But, you know, thanking hospitals, health plants, health organizations in general, mm -hmm. what are we seeing in other markets with respect to the role they're playing, you know, in return to work for their states and for their communities? Yeah, no, I think it's a great question, and it's a it's one I'm sure everybody on this call is grappling with, and um, even our clients that are in states that uh, I was on a phone yesterday with an executive in Texas, and you know they're they're opened up, and but you know they're they're trying to think about whether they should actually lead, uh, who's going to really take the leadership role in and return to work. There have been some interesting announcements. I think technology is going to play a huge role in all of this. Um, we can't, I like to say we cannot Lysol our way back to work. Uh, we can't Lysol our kids back to school either. We have to think creatively. Um, uh, I'm, I'm watching closely the United Health Group uh, partnership uh, with Microsoft, for example. Um, you know, I think that Google, Apple are doing some creative things that would allow us to do uh, some of the screening that we hope to, you know, kind of create, if you will, a digital front door to the office. Um, you know, it's not clear that we can test everybody. Um, that would be ideal, but it's just, uh, that's gonna take a lot of time. Uh, and that's a lot, of, that's a very expensive uh, to do. Um, and, and so there's a lot of creative ways in which I think we're gonna see technology play a role, whether that's screening, whether that's contact tracing, um, all of those terms that are, you know, being thrown around, as well as just really, uh, you know, to the point uh, Kaveh was making earlier, not all jobs have to come back. So we have to be really thoughtful about who comes back. And I like the way Kave framed this. We used to say, why aren't you coming to work? Now we gotta say, why are you know why are you not staying home? And and I don't know if folks caught that statistic, but we've done some research that 60% of jobs um, in the, you know, across industry in the United States could be repurposed to be um, work from home. Now that means you've got to set up the infrastructure and you've got to think about, you know, how do you make those folks as productive as possible and enable? Um, and, and that's tough too, because we all like, uh, you know, the physical interaction and the camaraderie and going to lunch or coffee with a colleague. Um, but it's going to take some reimagination and it's going to take some innovation uh, to get to where we think about what roles come back and how do we bring those that do have to come back physically to a work site, how do you bring them back safely using technology and some of the wonderful healthcare organizations you have in the state of Michigan. You have some of the finest mm -hmm. and uh, I am confident they're going to play a role in, in helping ensure the health and wellness of, um, of the state's employees. Kave, anything to add? I think you said it very well. Uh, so next question, and I know I opened the call by saying crystal balls are tough, but uh, this one may require a crystal ball, so just heads up. Um, so many healthcare services, as we know, over the last few months have been delayed, skipped, et cetera. Um, how much of this do we expect to come back in the second half of the year? I think there's this notion of a bubble. How big do we think that bubble may be? And is it will it make up for the lack of services over the past you know, yeah. 90, 100 days? Yeah. Uh, well, I'll tell you what what the current thinking is. So let's break this question into both uh, into elective and emergent care, because in theory, emergent care is not deferrable. Although we all recognize the published reports that suggest that the rate of heart attacks and strokes is lower than the historical rate would have predicted. And that just seems hard to believe, which is unlikely to mean that people didn't have them, but more likely to mean they had them but didn't seek care for them. That's interesting because on the short run, that looks like you're not going to bear any costs associated with that. But the truth is there may be complications associated with that that we'll recognize. But the elective procedures is another issue. So the challenge is that there isn't only so much capacity in the healthcare system, and it's not unlimited. So it is highly unlikely that three months of deferred electives can all be, there's enough slack in the system if everyone was as busy as they were before to add the additional three months on top. And I've heard a number of healthcare economists say that if you look at the next two years, all of 20 and all of 21, and you look at it just at utilization, there ultimately we will have used in aggregate less resources over that two year period of time. While it will come back, we just can't, it can't all come back because there's not enough capacity in the system. Some of the needs have, have simply disappeared. Uh, so I think that's kind of where the net is. Now that's just the utilization part. The challenge of course is that uh, the price of services also changes over this period of time. Historically, um, 
providers raise prices to compensate for reduction in volume. That's been true it, you know, for as long as we've been tracking it. And it would not be surprising to see that phenomenon play itself out over the next six to 18 months. And so from the perspective of healthcare costs, use and price go into that number. So we have both of these dimensions are gonna be in play as we start, as we try to prognosticate what 2021 even is gonna look like. 2012 will be a hard year to use, or 2020 will be a hard year to use the model anything off of. You'll have to make a lot of adjustments to think about 2021 off of 2020. Okay, thank you. So this question uh, from the audience is related to supply chain, and it's talking about a lot of the supply chain challenges that we saw as a result of COVID-19. You know, looking ahead, you know, what are the capabilities that healthcare organizations are going to need? Resources, staff, skills, tools, to be able to kind of have that, that level of resiliency in their supply base going forward. Yeah, so one of the things that we're um, talking a lot with our clients in the supply chain area is around the use of data and analytics to do more thoughtful predictions, um, back to the comment around surge. Um, in terms of, you know, the, it's, it's an area of healthcare um, that we have, you know, we've probably underinvested in. There was so much of, a, from a digital perspective, um, there was so much work done um, uh, of the last you know, decade to get hospitals and our healthcare organizations onto electronic medical records, which really created the digitization of clinical information. Uh, we, we've kind of, the next wave, and we were just starting to really see that wave come, was to really automate and infuse technology uh, more so into the back office. Um, and so the supply chain areas uh, being a key one. Uh, and so, you know, COVID kind of caught us uh, at, at where we were, and, and that was part of the, the challenge. Uh, I think there is going to be a lot of, uh, and I suspect I know a little bit of where that question is coming from, I think there's going to be a lot of really exciting innovation and opportunities in the supply chain area for some of the great uh, manufacturing capabilities that we have in this country, like I said, for them to step up and help us uh, think differently about um, how we supply and, uh, goods. You know, one of the things uh, that Accenture did um, as part of the COVID pandemic was we actually uh, stood up a platform to match some of our hospital clients with some of these non-traditional uh, suppliers who, who raised their hand and said, I can, you know, I can produce masks or I can repurpose a, a plant uh, or some manufacturing facilities to, um, to supply, make face shields or PPE of some sort. Um, there were eight companies from the state of Michigan in that uh, on that platform, which tells me there's, you know, we were harvesting some of the great talent and capabilities and a lot of them were small, medium businesses. Um, that looked and said, you know, I've got some capacity to do that. And uh, so I'm excited. That really, for me, was um, one of the, the real highlights of seeing the amount of innovation uh, and the um, uh, esprit de corps, if you will, of people trying to support um, others as we navigate our country, navigated this crisis and our industry. And Anything you want just Yeah, let me just add to that, Dean. I think that um, the concept of resilience as a requirement for supply chain will become is was necessary. And it's it's not an inconsequential statement because our supply chain was historically optimized for price. The effect of that was concentrate your purchasing in an entity that figures out the lowest price manufacturing, hence the dependency on a single source offshore. And I think that if we believe resiliency is important, then that is that there is a price associated with resiliency that we will have to consider as valuable and that consideration will then cause the supply chain to reorganize, to optimize for price and resiliency, not maximize for price. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it looks like we've got time for just one more. And I'll say if you've got some questions in here we didn't get to, I do have some names, so we'll try to do some follow-up. But uh, this last one we'll get in there. Um, audience members talking about uh, doctor home visits. And so I'm just going to build on it real quick. We've talked about the human truth around focusing on the home, I think we call it cocooning. Um, so two-parter, do we think doctor home visits will increase? And then I know Kavi, you and I have talked about where are other places that labs could be done in lieu of going into or diagnostics. So um, besides going into the doctor's office, you know, more at home and maybe more at uh, a pharmacy or what have you, your, your thoughts, both of you. 
Yeah, a simple, I'll just go quickly. First, the first issue is um, care on my own terms where and when I want it may or may not be home. It might be work, it might be at my kid's house, it might be any of those things. Second question is whether or not I need to have the doctor in the room with me or not. Mm -hmm. The home visit assumes that uh, that the visit needs to be face to face, but it also needs to be at home. And that may be true, you'll definitely see some of that. But in many cases, the answer might be, uh, you can get taken care of wherever you want to be, and we will only have the doctor in person with you if that's the only way to solve the problem. So I, what I think you're gonna see then is rather than moving from one to another is an evolution of multiple options, all of which best fit the needs of the, of the citizen in terms of the right care on their own terms. The only thing I would add, I completely agree. There's going to be a multi-channel view to how do you meet consumers or patients uh, where they are and where they want to be seen. I think wearables um, and the t proliferation of that technology will be really important because that will enable more of the monitoring in home. Um, and uh, I think you're going to see a lot of that, whether that's in your home or in your car or in uh, a number of different places. Uh, as we think about um, how important it is, how we reimagine the different ways and the channels you can um, utilize to serve patients. Okay. Well, I think that's just about it in time. So I guess I'll, I'll close where I started. And, and again, I know we've got a lot of folks from our healthcare uh, organizations out there and, and a genuine thank you for everyone's efforts. Um, Obviously, this is a, a community in a country that's hurting right now on multiple levels. I know we've got a lot of work ahead of us. You know, within the healthcare space, there's a lot of uh, discussions we need to have around disparities. Um, but uh, I do think Detroit and Michigan is up for the challenge. And uh, again, appreciate uh, everyone joining us today. And I think with that, I see uh, Marnita. So I'm going to give you the mic. And uh, thanks again, everybody. Truly appreciate the time. Marnita? Okay, yes, I'm here. I would like to thank the Accenture team for all this great information that they've shared. I would like you guys to know, and thank you for attending and uh, being on the seminar. Uh, after this is done, I will send an email out to you all with the uh, information that was shared as well as you will uh, have a video of this so you can uh, reference the information. I also ask that uh, you go to our website at www.detroitchamber.com slash COVID, where we have all types of information uh, for Restart Michigan. And uh, you can catch our Teletown series as well as uh, these webinars. I wish you all a safe and healthy rest of your day and uh, take care of one another and take care of yourself. Thank you. Bye. All right. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Have a great night. Take care. Thanks, Marnita. You're welcome. Bye, Kristen.